Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today, we have one of Greg's favorite airplanes. In fact, Greg is sublimated. That's the, my sublimated assistant. Another tough one, Greg. You've been working me out with these, these difficult words. Uh, and so today, we're going to get into one of Greg's favorite airplanes, the T-33, the Lockheed Shooting Star. Now, this, for us, will wrap it up in trainer land. This is people are going, yay, no more trainers. The trainer fans are going, I love trainers. The reality of it is, is this is the last one that we have in the collection. We're going to wrap it up today. And this airplane is really unique and it's where kind of everything started. So I'm going to get into it. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to grab my model as I use, usually do. And first thing I'm going to do is what is the name of this airplane, Greg? This is the shooting star. What do I have on my head? I have a hat that the staff picked for me that is quite apt. It has a bunch of stars on it. Although I look like a wizard more than a shooting star, I'm going to take this off. I'm going to toss it to my, oh, nice catch, nice catch. And it is continuing to be a little warm today. So again, I think Greg is hoping that he cooks my brain a little bit. But we're going to start into this uh, airplane with, first of all, I've got my model. Now this airplane, the reason it's a Kelly Johnson design, it's with Lockheed. And of course, Lockheed is one of those companies that never really, do you notice this, Greg? One of the companies that never really got gobbled up. We've talked about North American, and we've talked about Beach, and we've talked about other, a lot of these other companies. They've kind of gotten gobbled up along the way. Lockheed is still around, and I'm going to talk about a very cool airplane, Lockheed airplane at the end of this, that is coming in to uh, enter our, per, our, um, our permanent collection here shortly. But today, we're going to talk about the T-33. T for trainer, 33. This aircraft, there's a plan view. This airplane is a version of an interesting airplane, the P-80. The P-80 or the XP-80 when it was in design uh, with Lockheed actually went into, and this blows people away, this airplane actually went into design in 1943. Can you believe that? First flight of the P-80 was uh, the XP-80 was in 1944. And so one of the things on the design here is this is when American designers were trying to play catch up. We knew the Germans were working on jets. We hadn't seen the ME262, but we knew that the Germans were working on jets. And the American and the British designers were all working on trying to catch up in, uh, in design land and catch up with uh, performance. Now this particular jet, the P-80, which was a fighter, P is, Greg, pursuit, and then after the war they went to F, which is for fighter, also for Fred. It's exciting. I almost feel like I'm doing like a sesame thing. F is for Fred. But um, the, um, and I digress, Greg. I've completely blown my train of thought. So the, the P-80 was uh, a step into the land. You have to remember at that time, we were working also on the P-59. The P-59's performance was subpar. And actually, I want to call them, and we'll, we'll go Jurassic Park here, Greg, the apex predators of the time, which were like the Bearcat, the, the later versions of the P-51, later versions of the P-47, all highly evolved piston-engine airplanes. The P-59's performance at the end of the day just wasn't up to par with those piston-engine airplanes. So the P-59 was essentially a technology demonstrator. I only think, Greg, they built like 60 of the P-59. They, were very, they ordered more, but they realized getting into production that it wasn't going to work. The P-80, which was the fighter version of this airplane, became much more important in design. GE at that time was working on a, a turbojet engine, a single axial turbojet engine, and they, which was based off of the Whittle design. And if you're out there, the kids, go out and look up the Whittle design, the Whittle engine, and so the, we were trying to figure out how to beat the Germans initially in air superiority. Ultimately, what was the other uh, scary part of this, Greg? It was the MiG-15, which will color the conversation a little bit later. So the Germans were trying to get the 262, the British were trying to get the Meteor, 
and we were working on different versions of this jet. Now this had a turbojet engine in it. It breathed air through those uh, breathers up in the front. You had a jet engine and a jet, jet came out the back. Now that turbojet, as I said, was a single axial turbojet. Get excited about that, Greg? You do get excited about that. Now, we got that was a turbine engine, and where does turbine come from? This goes way back, Greg. It goes back to 1822 with Burdine, which was, or I believe it was Burdine. I probably butchered that name, but he came up with turbine off the Latin word turbo. Can you believe that? I had no idea, but Latin for turbo, and he came up with a turbine. Now, turbines can be steam turbines, they can be water turbines. In this case, there's a combustion chamber, and this is a jet turbine, which is an air breather. But they, uh, they were working on this single jet, uh, uh, the single axial engine. This turbojet, and Greg can throw up, we'll probably get an animation on how a jet engine works. I'm going to talk about fans in a minute. But the, um, the turbojet worked through combustion, I believe, on the J33, which was the engine in this, that there were 14 combustion chambers around this turbine. And Greg can, can come up with that animation. They required essentially the uh, explosions with the fuel to drive the turbine, obviously, and then the jet came out of the back. Um, that engine uh, generated about 4,000 pounds of thrust, up to about 4,600 pounds. And if you water injected the engine, uh, you could get a little bit more thrust out of it, which is in later versions. Now, Greg, who do you think built that engine? And I, it is hot out here again today, so I'm going to wipe off a little bit of that sweat. It has been hot in California the last, uh, what, about three weeks, Greg? We've been very warm. The GE built that engine, but who did they farm it out to? you have any idea? Another very familiar name, Allison. Allison built 6,000 of those engines. GE only built a few of them, and the reason for that was quite simple, Greg. It was that the... Um, Allison had the production line and could turn it out, and GE couldn't, if you can believe that. Allison uh, decided that they could turn out more engines, or they decided they could turn out more engines, and that was the reason that they did that. Now, this airplane, because of its design, there's a couple of things about this that are very unique. One, I have heard this airplane described, and until, by the way, this is a flyer, we fly this airplane, you can actually go out to our ride site and buy a seat in this airplane if you want. website. You can buy a seat in this airplane. Go check that out. But until I got really deep down into the engineering on this airplane, I've heard it described as a World War II airplane with a jet strap to it. And when you think about when it was designed in 1943, what were they using at that time? They were using off-the-shelf parts with this airplane, and they were using all those other fighter technologies. So that is an apt description of this airplane. The other thing you'll notice right off the bat is that straight wing. The straight wing was, uh, remember, we've talked about this before, especially with German designs. The Germans were experimenting with swept wing technology, but they didn't fully understand it. And the issue about the swept wing technology, and it goes back to the F-100, is that when they were sweeping the wings, they didn't understand what would happen with the air vortex if you were to stall the airplane. So when they were dealing with wing design, remember with the F-100, we got the saber dance. The reason was that the wing was stalling at different periods. The air 
wasn't flowing over the rent wing properly and the wing was losing lift. So the, the Sabre would do the Sabre dance in a certain performance. These straight wings air, airplanes, they had much better feel for. And so uh, that is why they stayed initially with the, with the uh, straight wing. Remember on the German ME262, which is a comparable airplane, the swept wing didn't have anything to do with aerodynamics. We've talked about it before, Greg. Why did, it, why did they do that? They did that for center of gravity. Because of those big uh, uh, Jumo engines hanging off underneath, they actually swept the wings back to help the airplane deal better with, with center of gravity. Now, this particular airplane in a fighter version was one of the frontline airplanes that actually survived the war. As I said, the uh, P-59 was a disappointment. And so what they ended up doing is they went with this airplane instead. Now, it was not, when we went into the Korean War, we got a nasty surprise. And how do we get a nasty surprise? The airplane's been on the show before, the MiG-15. And why did we get that surprise? Because the British licensed the Russians an engine, and the Russians reverse engineered it, and the engine had a lot more thrust. And so the MiG could outperform anything that the Americans were fielding at that time. And so the P-80 going into the Korean War uh, now became the F-80. And the F-80 was nowhere near a match for the MiG-15. Now, some of you P-80 drivers or F-80 drivers out there can argue with me. And please, let me have it in the comment section. But if you read about these two airplanes, the, the MiG and this airplane going up against each other, uh, this airplane quickly became relegated to ground attack as another airplane that we're going to uh, talk about, the F-86, came more into favor. That was a North American product. This airplane became much more ground attack. Now, there is a similar airplane, and what was that, Greg? What was that? The Panther. The Panther and the Cougar airplanes on the Navy side also used similar jet engine technology and just didn't have the performance early on in the war. Now, this airplane in the two-seat version was um, uh, a huge success in training command. The airplane was fairly docile. It, uh, it had some kind of wonky characteristics, but it was very, very good in the training command. It was also very good as a, Greg, a hack airplane. In other words, guys would fly this airplane around. It is notoriously um, thirsty is the kind word on fuel. It uses a lot of gas. And its performance is better up at altitude, better up above 20,000 feet. Uh, top speed is about 600 miles an hour, so it's subsonic. It is a non-afterburning airplane. The big thing about the T-33, and a lot of these made it into private hands, which we'll talk about, is that with these early jet engines, you had to be very, very careful about response time. When we see modern fighters, whether you see the F-18 or the F-15 or whatever, you see them um, put, put it to the gas or you watch Top Gun, you see those huge afterburner plumes come out of those engines. They have tons of power and the thrust to weight ratio is uh, massive. But the reality of these airplanes is that with this jet engine, it was all about engine management. Because what happens, Greg? You put that throttle forward and this thing doesn't immediately respond and if you don't or if you're not managing your airspeed a lot of guys will land this airplane short or they'll get into maneuvers where they don't have enough energy remember aircraft trigger what law Greg and this is for the kids at home this is the Fred fun fact I want you to go out and look this one up they trigger what law kids I want you to go home the kids that send me questions and stuff all the time Newton's third law of motion I want you to go out and look at that we're not going to spend any more time on it but Newton's third law of motion. Now, this particular airplane and these, these early jets caused the development, in, especially in airliners, of fan jets. The biggest difference between the jets that are in this and the fan jets is that the, in the fan jets and modern airplanes, and what I'm talking about a fan jet, you see those jet engines that have that big opening and those fans spinning. There's a jet engine in there, but that's driving an axle that drives the fan. And the, fan, the air goes over the outside of the jet engine and then comes out of the back. It gets squeezed out of the back as it accelerates. What happens there is those fan jets get most of their efficiency 
not from those combustion cans that we talked about that are around the engine, like the 14 that are around this J33. What they do is they get most of the energy from the fan. So the fan provides 30 to 70% of the thrust of the engine, as opposed to that combustion driving the turbine. So what ends up happening there is those fan jets are much more efficient, which is why you've seen, uh, and they're less thirsty, and because they're getting that they're getting that power from a byproduct of the of the of the combustion, not the combustion itself. So those jet engines they get 30 to 70 percent of their power from that fan. Isn't that cool, Greg? I think that's really cool. Somebody just sneezed off camera, and I think they may, may need medical help. That sneeze was that loud, Greg. We may have to stop and check that one out. So the, uh, the engines in this uh, were, were first generation. They caused a lot of changes. Now, the one other change, and then we're going to talk a little bit about this airplane, is that this airplane derived into a couple of different things. The one thing that it derived into was the F, I want to, I think, the F-94. The F-94 was the first afterburning, and if you look, at, look up that airplane, um, you can see a clear design relevance to this airplane. This airplane um, built into that was the first afterburning airplane that the Air Force had. So that's another thing that Greg can throw up there. The uh, interesting thing also about this is there's a whole other airplane that came out of this, Greg. The Sky Fox. Not many people know about that. The Sky Fox is a derivative airplane was actually started in the mid 80s. They bought 20 of these airplanes and what they did is they actually put fan jets in the cells on the outside of the hull and they closed the back of the airplane. And they're actually marketing that airplane kind of like the A7. Remember the A7 was modified into a strike fighter. They kind of, and I'm gonna reach over here. You notice how I'm doing this, Greg, without turning my head and having him flip over. We'll talk about gratuitous product placement. The Sky Fox had the engines on the outside Boeing actually bought the, um, the rights to that and was developing it. After a couple of years, they parked that design. It didn't happen. Greg can find a picture of the Sky Fox. My understanding, and Greg, we should find this airplane. It's like up in Oregon somewhere. We should get it. That's an airplane we should get a hold of. I understand it doesn't have the engines on it anymore, but it's sitting somewhere. So if any of you know, anybody knows where the Sky Fox is, we'd love to have that airplane. Bring it down here. We'll put it next to this one. But the, uh, the Sky Fox only lasted a little bit of time with Boeing, and then they discontinued the project. Now, having said that, um, the airplane made it all the way out until military service, Greg, until uh, 2017, where it retired with the Brazilian Air Force, if you can believe that. We've had this airplane in the inventory for about 10 years. It was donated. I'm going to do my my um, tribute here with my stage two, it was donated by a guy named Phil Hickson. Phil, if you're seeing this, Phil was a huge supporter of our museum, and we love you, and we thank you, and if you are a fan of the T-33, we're going to salute you, but we're going, I'm going here and another star. Look, Greg is just on fire today with stars. This is new grape soda since 1921. I am always afraid of anything that has color. Now, Greg, you're running this one. This is, this is actually dangerous. This is 200 calories and 75 milligrams of sodium. Ooh, yes, Greg is rubbing his tummy, and he gets some calories here. Now, the other thing that's a little scary about this is it's Best Buy 0920. I'm not seeing the telltale preservative ring that nearly killed me with some of this other stuff. We're going to give it a shot. To Phil and all you T-33 drivers out there, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Whew. Greg, I think he's, he's, he's smiling again. Look, he, oh man, that's a, the last three have been, oh, it's just, this is like cough syrup. Oh man. Well, New Grape is not a sponsor of the program. Give it one more shot, as I always do. Oh, my goodness. Man, that is nasty. Greg has accomplished. Look at that smile. Accomplished his mission. Ooh. Now, 
this airplane, like everything we do, and I'm going to move a little bit in the shot here, and Greg can follow me, this airplane, all of the airplanes in the inventory are tied to local people, either squadrons or veterans, because we believe it is extremely important to support our folks. This aircraft is actually in colors of a fighter interceptor wing that flew out of March Air Force Base, which is really cool. And then with a lot of our airplanes, you can come and you can see all the names. These are all pilots who flew this airplane. There's Phil Hickson's name uh, there. He was in the United States Air Force. A lot of pilots, maintainers, people that were in the United States Air Force, but it's really nice. And if you see this airplane at an air show, you can uh, check it out and uh, see all these cool names. And also, hopefully we'll get this thing over to March Air Force Base and we can get it uh, photographed with some of their airplanes. As I said, this airplane actually is uh, the jet that we operate in the fleet. It is really cool to fly in. You should see that. Now, I'm going to put this down and I'm going to pick up my gratuitous product placement. Now, my gratuitous product placement today is, look at this beautiful, beautiful, made from the highest quality materials, United States Air Force hat. Look at that. It's got it on the back. This is a nice hat. This will be on our website. <clears throat> You're going to want to pick up one of these puppies here. Greg wants five. I can see that right now. Yeah, he's nodding his head. So get out to our website on our gratuitous product placement and pick up this beautiful hat. If you're a United States Air Force veteran. And again, the big thing about this airplane, I'm going to move back over here. Again, the big thing about this airplane is that think about the P-59 as a uh, demonstrator. This really, in historical terms, is the first kind of practical U.S. fighter, uh, jet fighter, that was deployed right after World War II. It has a major place in history because of that. It continues to uh, serve on in affectionado hands. We have them. There's a number of them. Did you know that T-33 Gregs were flying chase for experimental aircraft as recently as the 737 MAX? So they're still flying chase in some of these programs. NASA's used them. They're, they're still flying chase for some of the development programs. So they're still being operated to this day. If you get a chance, see one at a, uh, an air show near you or come out and check this one out at our site. Remember, my name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. We really appreciate you being with us today. Smash that subscribe button. Like us on Facebook. We can use your donations as well. We can always use your donations. And remember, you need one of these United States Air Force hats more than anything. You need to go out and buy one of those. I want to thank you and have a wonderful day.